Well, an official welcome again to you all. Um, St. Patrick's Church, we're kind of the audience as well as Anthony Visco is a good friend of ours and lives right down the road. And so it's, um, we're part of the audience as well, journeying in Lent through the sacred art. We've done so far um, light and darkness. And then we've also done as well last week, uh, the flesh, bone of my bone of flesh of my flesh. This week we have image and likeness. Anthony, just one thing too, I think we have the light and darkness drawn up. Do you want to go to your other slideshow? No, I just did this for, yes, I will. Oh, this, I see. It is this review. Show. No, no, no. I just want to sort of recap how we started yep. and how we got here tonight. Well, I've introduced you enough, so I'll interject a little as we go, but okay. off we go. What do you say? Fine. Uh, right. For those of you who might have not seen the first one, the first one was, was Looks at the neighbor. The, the story of light and shade and really was about, sorry, the um, the first day of creation. And we went on the first day where light is separated from dark. And then the fourth day when the uh, planets are put into place and we have a different kind of light and shade. And it introduced the idea of an invisible light and a visible light, two different sources, two different things, two different reasons why we make for them as different in art. And then we went on to bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, which sort of extended on that still within the, the first chapter of Genesis uh, and how we use flesh in sacred art. And this not only, as, as I said earlier, we divided light from dark. Now we divided nude from naked and that had a critical impact on how we use flesh in sacred art or how we don't. Um, tonight, we're going to move on to image and likeness it is and the separation between the two, just as light and dark was separated, just as uh, nude and naked was separated. Uh, the, the idea of image and likeness also gets separated uh, at the fall, at the expulsion from Eden, uh, the early desert fathers believed that there was a separation uh, between the idea of image and likeness. That, yes, we had been made in the image and likeness of God. Here is a fresco by Pio della Francesca of the death of Adam. Uh, he, and he dies still without the likeness, or did he regain it? It's a question. Nevertheless, um, the early desert fathers believed that we maintained the image, but lost the likeness. And our duty here, or our task here on earth was to do whatever we could to regain that image and therefore re regain that grace. As we know in the Annunciation, it's very clear, hail full of grace. Born without original sin, of course, means uh, our Lady is is full of grace and therefore um, never was missing anything. It maintained at conception the image and likeness of God. So we also see that's why sometimes, at least in in for many periods of art, the um, expulsion and the Annunciation were included in one painting. Early Christian iconography is really pretty simple. We have to understand we're an underground culture here. Um, it's not as if they can go and put ads out for the best artists anywhere, come down into our catacombs and, and do it, do your best. When we, when we look at things like uh, 79 AD and, and Pompeii and frescoes, and we realize what, what just uh, a few hours away were being painted in the catacombs. And some of the most popular images were uh, the Good Shepherd, and you can see it's sort of in Roman dress, um, beard, beardless, beardless. In fact, we always refer to these as um, uh, the sacrifice of, of uh, Isaac above. We refer to these as the Apollo Christ. Here's Daniel. And um, Christ and Magdalene, Noli me tangere. But the early desert fathers, as I said, decided that, not decided, but would discuss and write about how 
and what we must do to regain this image. But in that separation, um, as I mentioned earlier in the former lectures, uh, visible light, invisible light, material form from formlessness, finite space versus infinity, time, eternity. The artist's job and the theologian's job, of course, is how do we reconcile this, this, these, these two different things. In um, early Byzantine iconography, as, as we move the uh, um, empire to Byzantium, we find that the early uh, Byzantine icons or any imagery was pretty simplistic and always with scripture. However, debates started, especially in uh, the fact that they're now neighboring with um, Muslims, especially in Syria. And Islam is saying there's, there's no images permitted and it does have an influence on the early church. However, uh, and we're gonna see next week, Islam did have images. In fact, they were figurative in, in the first years of, uh, of uh, Islam and then went from figurative to fauna and flora. Got to a point where, where, where some of the emperors were actually destroying some of the churches in Constantinople because of the images. Uh, Islam then moved on to, uh, from fauna and flora to what we call hot uh, geometry. And it's, it's incredibly beautiful and it's not non-representational. They're always based on a number and the number has a theological meaning. And it would go into a period where, well, the only thing allowed is the image of the Theotokos and Christ. And that's it, the only two things. St. John of Damascus argues that we are not anthropomorphizing God. The word was made flesh. So it, it's not something that we're imposing. In fact, we have a duty to represent the incarnation and argues on the behalf of both East and West. And again, we see him here with the image of Christ and the image of the uh, Theotokos. In former times, God who is without former body would never be depicted. But now when God is seen in the flesh, conversing with men, I make an image of God whom I see. I do not worship matter. I worship the creator of matter who became matter for my sake. And on those words, great councils came about. And um, the still a division between the East and West on, in terms of what kind of image or how it should be done. The East was more of very simple, no perspective, etc. gold leaf. The West made a different uh, idea and said, we're not gonna go two dimensional, we're gonna go three dimensional as well. So we went through a, another hundred years of iconoclasts after Leo III. And it's, it's not until um, Empress Theodora comes about and places an icon of the Theotokos on her, on her dying husband's chest and he gets cured that it becomes uh, celebrated in the East as well and gives permission to, to uh, indeed um, do these icons. It's, uh, it's interesting that this Sunday is the Triumph of Orthodoxy Sunday uh, and it's the first Sunday of Lent and it's always celebrated because it's supposedly the, this miracle of, of the cure occurred on March 11th of 843. So the first Sunday of Lent to them is the uh, Triumph of Orthodoxy and the icon. Um, Dionysus of Forna writes a, a manual which still exists. Uh, and it's very, very clear. These are the proportions for every single icon, every character down to what size beard, what shape beard, should it be forked, should it be rounded, um, on and on and on. Anthony, and uh, just, a, just a quick fun interjection as you're going through this history of icons and then iconoclasm. I would, we, we had covered this in a early church uh, course in the Middle Ages, but it was in it was in the late, late 600s, I remember, it was Pope Sergius. The East had a council and they condemned the West 
for even depicting Jesus as a lamb. So not only the proportions of beard and stature, but as a lamb, and that was condemned. And so the Pope responded by not only approving art depicting a lamb, but also inserting into the liturgy to what is today the, the Lamb of God, the Agnus Dei chant. Just kind of, there was not only tension in the East, but it's good to remember there was even tension in councils between Eastern and Western art. Yeah. yeah. Which now is almost unthinkable that we would argue about those things, but, you know. But do, does your Orthodox uh, use the Agnus Dei at all? No. No, okay. But this, this comes actually very late. It was, um, uh, like I said, it's still available. I actually have this book as well. Uh, it's interesting because it tells you what is necessary and enough. And if you wanted to add more, you could, of course, but in, in, in Orthodox, Orthodox uh, iconography, you can't, but in Western, we can. So it's a good source. We have Cennino Cennini on our side who writes the Libro d'Arte and it's more of a technical book, but also does involve the, the, the theological aspects as well. And this becomes the source written way before, fi almost 500 years before the uh, Dionysius book is written. But we're well on our way of making these, these uh, paintings. We don't have the same um, laws. So therefore we have a, almost a greater responsibility in a sense that we're not just filling in these, these icons with the same images. We have, first of all, all perspective is artificial, as we say. We have linear perspective, which you know the West uses, axiometric, reverse perspective, which is more um, on, on the Eastern uh, uh, attribute. However, we also have par parallel space. We have all different kinds and we have total uh, use of it whenever we choose. This is, of course, more of a Western thing of, of the diminishment. Western art, in, in a sense, establishes this idea of infinity by perspective, where the Orthodox use the idea of infinity by null space, gold, actual light and shade, or artificial light and shade, uh, illusionistic light and shade. And you can see one from the other, um, same image, same uh, enunciation, right? Same theme. This one on the, the Eastern one is more parallel in space. Uh, the other idea is, it, it's interesting how both use the idea of the red drapery, which in, in the East is always, uh, means that this happened inside. If you notice, there's no landscape, there's no rooms. This happened inside. But as I said earlier, the West said, not only will, will we do two dimensional, we'll do three dimensional as well. The object of course was to assist the faithful in regaining the likeness. But over the years, as we all know, um, our most uh, valued and precious and meaningful images, icons uh, are now in museums and they're not part of our liturgy and they're not part of our devotion, unfortunately. And um, although we can still visit them, um, this is the, one of the last suppers in Florence, the Ghirlandaio. When uh, in grade school, Again, we're, we had these images. We didn't know anything else but them, in a sense, from religious calendars. But we had a course called Poetry and Picture Studies, one of my favorite courses. It was only on Friday afternoons. And the nuns would give us, give us these little booklets. And we would look at things like Titian's uh, Presentation of the Virgin or Murillo's uh, Assumption of the Virgin. And we, you know, would study them and read read about them. And but this was another one that was always in our books, um, the Angelus by Millet. And this was another one called the Helping Hand. So if it didn't have uh, a religious uh, content to it, it had a moral aesthetic. It was good because it did good. 
this one was, uh, I remember this fondly because it was one of my bookmarkers. Then, um, as the great poet says, there was something, something was blowing in the air, uh, or something was blowing in the wind, I should say. Uh, and the great uh, change in the 60s that came about, here's Andy Warhol's Last Supper. I don't blame him, by the way, at all for having done this. Um, this is what was being asked, in a sense. The, the idea that art had to be relevant all the time, that da Vinci was relevant for his time, let's find out who's relevant for our time. I think there's three reasons why our art went the way it did and it, it is not as, as vital as it once was in assisting us to, to uh, regain some of these things. One was the photograph. One was modernism in, in these new proportions, and the third was Vatican II. Modernism and the um, photograph both have something very, very much in common, and that's the timestamp. The photograph is always of the moment. It's not before, it's after, it's, it's frozen in time, that particular moment. Modernism is timestamped by the zeitgeist. We know exactly what period that came from. Vatican II didn't say anything about either. Vatican II simply said, the church has no official style. And therefore it sort of let in these interpretations. It did make a recommendation that the church should really consider contemporary artists. And, and a lot of times we you know we, we realize that the word contemporary, because this is written in Latin, they got translated as modernist. And I never believed that that was the intention of, of the, the council. But here we have it. We have St. John Amola, you know, this is her altar in, in uh, her hometown. And it's a blow up photograph of herself in time, not in eternity. This is her image. This is not her likeness in eternity. So we have things that need to be reconciled here. This is, uh, the, uh, the Nava tapestries at the LA Cathedral. And one of the things is that we look at this and we say, okay, I don't know these people, but I know, all I could think of is the model who modeled for this. And that becomes again, like a photorealist timestamp. Here's another work, work of John's. So he uses the same style, the same approach for uh, whether it's a secular or sacred. And of course we have the movie version of uh, of images, how and how it's one influenced the other. This is a, is again a photo. This I actually saw a version of this in Bologna a couple of years ago, and someone's taken the shroud of Turin and said, "Hey, you know what? We can do a three D print of it." And this is what Jesus looked like in the tomb. Um, it's a photo. It's a three D photo. Mies van der Rohe. Um, or Kabusia, excuse me, came up with a new system of, of proportions and it got used over and over again and over again. This is um, Matisse's Stations of the Cross. This is actually a, a, a corpus for um, Sagra Familia in, in Barcelona. This is gross. This was in um, Eucharist of Congress here in, in 1976. So I can go on and on and on. These are Barnett Newman's Stations of the Cross, the first four stations. And Anthony, oh. are, are not those stations presently in the Modern Art Museum in DC, right? One would hope they're in, in a museum and not in a church. I think they're, they're, they are in DC, I've seen them there. Can okay. I interject with one quick question while you're sure. still going? My question is, we've talked about this before, how you and I both like photography, but we've talked about how it's very different from a painting. A painting is sort of a, a heavenly eternal perspective. Photography is always past. Once the photo's taken, it's past. Like I had said that the Los Angeles Cathedral, it's, it's, uh, it grabs your attention. These figures are so lifelike 
you know, Martin de Porres or Rosa Lima, but it does make you think of the models. It makes you look at a time where a photograph is, is timestamped as you're saying, but I, I can understand why the church, you know, in Gianna Mola or John Paul II or Mother Teresa, it's, it's because we have photographs of saints, I can see the tension why we would want to employ those. So I'm not saying we shouldn't do paintings, but my, 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 my real question is, I can see how in a modern era, there's this tension between do, do, do his photographs or a more eternal painting. I don't understand, however, why you would change, as you had said just previously, the proportions of the human body and make the body shaped differently. What do you think is the motive of that? Again, I think it's zeitgeist. It is, now I'm going to talk about the change of proportions and the reasons why from uh, a theological point of view, but not an artistic point of view. They're two different things. Okay. But as, as, as Benedict tells us in the, in the uh, spirit of the liturgy, the one thing sacred art cannot be is non-representational. The Barnett Newmans are non-representational. They have no sign or symbol in them. You can't say, oh, that fourth station is symbolic of Jesus meets Mary. It, it can't be, it just isn't. And um, so the idea of, con of, again, picking contemporary famous artists was the sort of uh, idea of the times. And if, if the photo gets time stamped, so does modern art, or modernist art, I should say. And that's, that was the Vatican's probably only flaw, well, I shouldn't say only flaw, but it starts to enter the church and you can see it here, one after another distortion of proportion. This is in the Basilica of Assisi. And of course, this is in Rome. This is also one of the stations of the cross in bronze. So here we have Carlo Cudis with his attributes, you know, a backpack, an Apple laptop, and of course, Steve Jobs as a saint. Same attributes, by the way. The, the idea that we're using the photograph only as a means of contemplation is also a problem, but we do have this thing of, as Father, you just mentioned, we do know what our saints look like in light. However, how do we, now that we have these images, we can't invent them like we did with uh, St. Dominic and St. Francis and St. Cecilia, on and on and on. These people existed in, in a period where their image or likeness, I should say, could be recorded. But now that they've gone on to their glory, they, we need to reconcile that image and likeness again. This is the other extreme of this where we're, you know, I, I think of that poetry and picture study book when I was a child and what, what I saw was as I was exposed to. Um, and um, what our children are being exposed to now. Fun facts, San Ramon Nonatus had his lips pierced by Islam for preaching. These are not fun facts. Uh, and I, I think we're, we're doing a great disservice. I find this sometimes more offensive than completely abstract art um, or non-representational at all. As, as Oscar Wilde said that, you know, bad art is worse than no art at all. This again is, is blessed Pier Giorgio. Jesus is having a birthday. I can go on and on and on, but I think we, we need to uh, go over this again. We're being offered a great opportunity here, knowing what they look like in life. And I think um, there's three things that when I look at the art of the past and the art, but some people are doing some beautiful, beautiful things today. So I don't wanna uh, condemn everything here, but I, I came up with three ideas of presence, witness and transcendence that uh, I, I think we're in a lot of the works that uh, did assist us throughout the centuries. Four aspects of presence, it must show a proportionate likeness to what is recognizable and what is knowable about the known. Second, it must be whole. Its members interrelated, nothing in Congress, a self-contained entity. Whoops, sorry. Its poised position, composition of place much appear to be the result of its thoughts. And fourth, 
let me get this. I can't see it because this thing was blocked. So I'm sorry. This happened before. The bottom, uh, the toolbar blocks my. I can read it for you. It says it must contain both the average and the ideal. The average and the ideal. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. First, presence. Every culture has an idea of what's proportionate and what's whole. And the, the incongruity of parts. If we go throughout history, the idea of cropping a figure or cutting something off um, to make it illegible or didn't show the known and the knowable, uh, it was considered taboo. And so we have it in, in Egyptian culture, we have it in, in, in Buddhist culture. Um, it's different, of course. I mean, people would look at this, especially a Westerner, especially anybody uh, who has studied anatomy and say, well, wait a minute, this doesn't, this has an incongruity to it. Yes and no. I mean, we, they, there's a different metaphor of body parts in Buddhism where uh, it's really, again, based on not what it appears to be, but what it feels like. So uh, Buddha's eye should be, look like an opening lotus blossom. Buddha's nose should be as soft and as rounded as uh, a parrot's beak. Buddha's arm should appear boneless. And we can see that in the, in the arm there. As soft as a baby elephant's trunk. So it's a different form of iconography, but nevertheless suits their theology as well. Our obsession or interest, I should say, in human proportions comes from uh, a, a Roman base, mostly Vitruvius, and this idea of the most proportionate man would be um, what we call the Vitruvian man, fit in a circle square. And for, for so many years, people tried over and over and over again to, to make this work. It does, it doesn't, because they always made the same mistake until da Vinci. And da Vinci's Vitruvian man becomes, as we all know, it's, it's so emblematic for so many things. It's a universal. And he did something that uh, no other artist had done or architect had done before him, where he used the circle as the symbol of eternity and makes the center of the circle, the navel, which is, is our point of conception where we grow uh, in the womb. He makes the root of the genitals the center of the square, which is the temporal. So we have the temporal and the eternal overlapped, two different centers. This is, this to me is a, um, it's a map of heaven on earth essentially, or the overlapping of both. His interest in this idea of, of uh, conception uh, is, is in so many of his drawings. The one on the right is uh, uh, a new artist who was working in Poland, uh, Kuba Ambrose, who uh, I, I think the, the parallel between these two images is, is quite amazing. Um, secondly, it must be whole, its members interrelated, so nothing in Congress a self-contained entity. No matter how crude or whatever um, this might seem, when you compare it to some of the modernist versions, one thing that is, is very uh, important in sacred art is that we don't really seem to be attracted to or hold in great interest or value feigned, uh, feigned naivete. These artists, were doing the best they could with what they had, what was knowable and known at the time. No one was being stylistic, but again, the wholeness was there. And we see as more information and more uh, uh, practice is involved, how um, it gets inc incorporated, never, never omitted or deleted. Even in part, this is a, a, a Domenico Ferri uh, painting, his contemporary. Even in perspective, this is a Dali again. 
So you can imagine the wholeness of this, even from this view. Its poise, position, and composition of place must appear to be the result of thought, of its thought. Again, when we look at the early uh, works from the church, this deposition, every placement, every figure has a purpose to it. And, and um, again, no feigned naivete. It's again with Frangelico, composition of place. The, the, the fact that we're, we had all these works, and we still do, of that the position is a result of its thought. This is a contemporary artist, um, Raul Berzalza from Malaga, Spain. And uh, this is St. Martin de Pours. Incredible painter doing some wonderful things for churches all over the world now. It must contain both the average and the I ideal. Arthur Thompson wrote an incredible handbook of anatomy for artists. And in, in, the, in the beginning of one of the chapters, he said, art seeks an average, excuse me, I made a mistake here. Science seeks an average, art an ideal. So when we look at the scientific aspect of it, yes, there is some idea of proportion and it is to, uh, it is scientific but it's also seeking, the art part seeks an idea. So anatomy is always on the more scientific end. And somehow we try to bring the two together to make the ideal. These, this is Albrecht Durer. Photography, on the other hand, is always sort of of the average. This is Rodin's St. John. And you can see how even sculptors now are copying from photographs. And uh, again, we get the the sort of time stamp on it. It's not, the Rodin is nothing that you would put in a church or, or venerate in any way. Um, and of course the Corbusier proportions come into play. The realism, by the way, again, there's this aspect of, of um, the photo and realistic art. What happens in the 19th century, it really takes off and there's uh, this idea of what muscles exactly would atrophy during crucifixion. This is the, a, a cast of, of uh, the Thomas Banks cast. And uh, the various doctors got together and said, you know what, we want to study this. And um, why don't we uh, try to get a corpus of an executed prisoner, whoops, sorry, and um, have him uh, flayed and crucified as quickly as possible. And they did, and they made a plaster cast of it. And people drew it and they painted it, but it is not the Corpus Christi, obviously. It is more of a scientific experiment that essentially failed to produce anything in terms of sacred art. This of course is going back again to Brunelleschi and Donatello who argued with each other as to which one was worse in a way. And, uh, Donatello said to Brunelleschi, he said, you made, mine looks like a peasant compared to yours. But then again, that was a compliment. Photography was not really the culprit when we see what certain artists did with it. I just showed you Rodin and his St. John. This is um, a photograph of a model posing for Tarsisius for the sculptor uh, Falguier. And he produces one of the most beautiful sculptures of uh, St. Tarsisius uh, holding the Eucharist that uh, is possible. I've never seen any better than this, by the way. There's, there's been some things done with St. Tarsisius, but nothing like this. So it can happen, is what I'm saying. It can happen. Um, witness. four aspects of witness. The work is open and all-inclusive. That is, it does not alienate the viewer. It must look like the action is still with us, still occurring and or ongoing. It has credible impact on the senses and through the senses. Again, I'm sorry, this, this bar keeps getting in the way. So Father Tim, if you could read that last part for me, please. Number four. 
Okay, I'll, I'll get it when I get there. The the work. If, sorry, if the, work, the, the last thing was just that it's it says that the experience of the work depicted is internalized by the viewer. Yes, yes, that's important. If we can't internalize it, it's not going to be transformative in any way. Uh, one of that one of the things is engaging. If if um, uh, for some of you that that heard some of these talks last year, I spoke about the canons of composition and how bilateral uh, composition does pull us in indeed and includes us. Here's uh, Domenico Veneziano's sacred conversation. Again, the, um, uh, the, the Angelus by Millet where it shows an equidistance of the figures, which means an equality. And it also is equidistant from the viewer, which also shows a form of equality and inclusion. Of course, many of our churches are based on this bilateral system. We respond to it. it it's on a, uh, a very visceral level. It's part of our experience. We experience ourselves this way. We experience each other this way. So uh, in, in fact, um, many of our churches here in the United States are based on this. It does change somewhat in, in modernism again, but uh, nevertheless, we are seeing a return of the cruciform church. And of course, uh, great works like Da Vinci's Last Supper, bilateral, inclusive. It does not alienate us in any way. And the great Ghent altarpiece, of course, even though there's a different scale of figures, there's so many different scales of figures in this painting alone. Uh, the, the central triptych of uh, Christ John the Baptist, or John the Evangelist, excuse me, and uh, uh, Christ the King, as opposed to the angels, as opposed to Adam and Eve, on and on and on. It still doesn't alienate us in any way. And of course, uh, Il Disputo by Raffaello, very inclusive or drawn in right to the center. The use of center in sacred art uh, is very, very uh, important and significant because it tells us what is center and central. Of course, that became a taboo in modernism. Anybody that went to art school in the 60s, 70s, probably even now, when the teacher says, never put anything in the middle. And it, it, there's a reason, it means something. So. Um, it, it's a uh, uh, too important a place. It's it's a hot spot. It must look like the action is still with us, still occurring or ongoing. Of course, Counter Reformation art uses this to a great deal. Uh, here's Bernini's David. He's still in action. Here's Moki's Saint Veronica in the Vatican. So there were many devices in order to do this. And it did give a great sense of witness to uh, the, uh, the viewer and the faithful. Um, again, going back to the canons of composition, this is the helical or spiral modality. This again is a Moki, his uh, St. Gabriel in the Annunciation they did for the Cathedral of Orvieto. Now, this is interesting. I've, I've tried to see these a few times, and they're always locked in the basement. And they can't find the custodian with the key. They were in the cathedral itself. And then again, during the whole modernist zeitgeist thing, were taken down and put somewhere else because they weren't original. They weren't part of the original uh, idea of the cathedral. And um, so when we start separating our art in terms of periods, we're getting into zeitgeist again, as if this begat that. It becomes very Darwinian in a sense. Uh, and that's something also that's had a great uh, uh, impact on the making of sacred art that um, when I say Darwinian, so it's, it's as if, you know, well, we, we lost our tail and we can't grow it back. Beauty was a tail that we lost and we'll never find it again. And uh, I, I don't think we, we can afford to do that. This is the great uh, uh, Nicola Darca work in Bologna as well. And the other impact on this, the, the fact that this is life-size, all these figures, these terracottas are life-size. So of course we have on the left here, someone who goes to Bologna and does a performance art piece with these figures nearby. And um, as you can see, it, that's the one that gets the timestamp. 
Nicodemus stares straight out at the viewer. He's the only one on his knees. Everyone else is standing. Christ is laying dead center. No pun intended, but and Nicodemus stares at the viewer here. It has a credible impact on the senses and through the senses. That means that, that this is uh, how we receive it, of course. Um, very Thomist. This is another example of life-size polychrome figures at these depositions. And um, these fortunately are not a museum. These we, we can get to see and experience and sit with. But the idea of touching becomes probably one of the most critical themes in this kind of, of work. And of course, the, the object for these artists was to inspire and instill in us a sense and desire to be more like that, uh, to regain likeness. Of course, we see this one as the epitome here and, and well deservedly so. We wonder, I wonder sometimes why Michelangelo has never been even declared servant uh, of God or venerable or something. I mean, how many conversions has this one sculpture made? Um, I had uh, teaching, I'd say maybe almost 30 years ago, I, I had a, an Islamic student who came into my figure modeling class. And of course, we were doing nude in the studio and he had a great difficulty with it. He just couldn't work. And uh, he didn't speak much English at the time, but he, he said, why can't we do the mother? And I did not know what he was talking about. He said, you know, like the mother, the mother, why can't we do the mother? And he complained about how seeing uh, the, the nude in the studio was going to, you know, ruin him for marriage. So he, he wasn't coming to class. I gave him outside projects. And then I said, show me what you mean by the mother. And he came in with a photograph of the Pieta. It was a very, uh, moving night for us. And of course, these this sort of inside outside, but still connecting us to the senses that, of some apparition. That's another invisible. This one uh, is an incredible painting because it deals with both uh, the perspective of the painting and the non-perspective where figures are coming out of it. So it's St. Thomas Aquinas presenting his works to Christ on the cross uh, and, um, and Christ saying, what do you want of me? And of course he says, I want you. So this is uh, another way of playing on the senses, two different spaces, which is, is why I say, you know, in, in terms of, we are incredibly fortunate in, in terms of, of the West that we're, we're enabled to do this and still it's considered sacred art. This also is another way of, of uh, uh, contributing to the senses of an ongoing. The um, how did the Rococo certainly did it for us and still, do, I mean, when we, when we realized that had Vatican II said, instead of saying the church has no official style, no, we can go from Cistercian without one piece of molding, we have th that aspect and we can go all the way to, uh, to uh, Bavarian Rococo. We have it all. I borrowed as much as I could from those people to do the St. Rita of Kasha here um, to keep it going in a sense, because um, as we know, St. Rita wasn't canonized till 1900. So she missed every period every single, she missed the Renaissance, she missed the Baroque, she missed the Counter-Reformation, all of it, all of it. Um, and so all we have is these sort of 19th century plaster casts of, of her in habit holding a crucifix. And I, I just felt that uh, her life and her vision was uh, much more worthy of, of something uh, that was more uh, explicit of that and, gave, and helped others uh, bring witness to it. The experience is internalized in the viewer. Again, one of the um, main themes that we see over and over again is the, is the aspect of, of touching the body of Christ in some way. I 
we can easily identify with the uh, with that desire because it is a form of of uh, becoming more like and regaining likeness. Of course, the Caravaggio has to be one of the most uh, uh, forceful images of this. But we also have uh, uh, our other saints in history who have had um, apparitions, visitations, where they embraced the uh, crucified Christ. This is a new artist, uh, Gasparo. He is. Um, Again, uh, an incredible young man who is very, very, very talented and uh, is doing wonderful work in Sicily and in other places as well. He doesn't include a lot of figures, but just this idea of all these hands around uh, the Christ figure, like, much like the um, uh, Frangelico, but more, a little more compounded where Frangelico does it as the mocking of Christ. This is all the... Um, the symbols of the passion. Transcendence. Uh, this is another quote from Benedict who uh, uh, very much inspired a lot of the, the, the things behind this um, 20 years ago when I, when I was reading Spirit of the Liturgy. The ability or quality to use the visual to express the invisible. This is where we have a problem, especially jumping from the photograph um, to, to something invisible. We also have it with uh, our incorruptibles. We, we see them in these glass urns and that's what they look like now, but it's still not what they look like in eternity. This is where maybe we can borrow a little bit from uh, the East again. The work should inspire personal transformation in order to inspire communal transfiguration. The corporeal likeness is super or transmundane in order to show the unlikeness. So it's, it's sort of like the, what I call the, it's like me, but it's not like me factor. And I think that that's a very important element in sacred art. Again, I cannot see the bottom line here. The last one but, says it's, its message is neither depleting nor depleted, but ongoing and endless. Yes, thank you. Now, as we discussed before in uh, Light and Shade, we have different ways of expressing the invisible. One is always the, the halo, gold. This is not something that we see. So we're showing, even though we do it in a visible art form, of course, we do it as symbolic of the invisible or the aura. So we're trying to show this invisible light of course, as I said, we, we can only do it in visible terms, but the invisible light factor is, is major here. And we go on to discuss that later in, um, in terms of uh, transfiguration. Transparency also assists in this to show a different kind of, of uh, reality. This is Blake's Dormition of the Virgin, very interesting. Uh, composition way of doing it. And of course, we have uh, Salvador Dali in his uh, depiction of the crucifixion of St. John of the Cross. When Pius XII approached Dali about trying to help and save the sacred arts, he advised him to um, go to Avila and ask to see in the reliquary the drawing of St. John of the Cross. St. John of the Cross um, had uh, the, the habit of taking a crucifix to the dying and leaning it over them to kiss. And he got the idea, of course, the, the image is, is turned more upright, but if you can imagine it turned to its side with the Christ figure coming down, 
he drew that and said, I want to see what the dying are seeing. I want to see this as well. So he did this drawing. It's kept in the reliquary there. And so Dali did, saw it and did some drawings of it. And um, of course, produced this famous crucifixion of St. John of the Cross. Again, he tries to combine everything, but notice how he chooses two completely different perspectives, two different spaces um, on purpose. This is again, to make it like us, not like us. Um, the painting hung in the uh, Museum of Glasgow, which it still is now in Glasgow, Scotland. And shortly after its installation, it was slashed. And here it is uh, with the big slash in it. And the director curator called uh, Salvador Dali and he said, Mr. Dali, I have something terrible to announce. Your painting has just been slashed. And Dali said, oh, that doesn't surprise me at all because I would think that that kind of image and that kind of balance and that kind of, of symmetry would throw anyone on the edge completely mad. And um, of course, Dali restored the painting and it's still there. Another aspect of that is, is this sort of transparency of ongoing where it, it, there's a certain amount of, of ambiguity and intentional incongruity. This is uh, Ernst Fuchs, who, who uh, started the School of Visionary Art. He's, he's deceased now, but um, another interesting uh, artist who, uh, whose mother had him baptized uh, so the Nazis wouldn't take him, but he grew up as a, as a faithful Catholic and did some incredible, incredible uh, painting. This is his uh, apparition of, uh, this is his, his version of Noah, and the fiery bush. The work should inspire personal transformation in order to inspire communal transfiguration. This is not easy stuff. So one of the ways that we've done it in the past was to anthropomorphize uh, figures, especially the abstracts, in terms of personification figures. This is something that uh, we, we've lacked since I'd say maybe World War II, we're not even seeing it in the secular, things like Logan Circle, the fountains and Statue of Liberty, perfect example of, uh, of a personification figure. So it's either theological uh, virtues um, and um, here's Del Sarto's version, Faith, Hope and Charity and uh, Fortitude. Another one, a chart of, of the other virtues. Jado does both virtues and vices. They are constant reminders. Of course, the great iconostasis is another form of, of this in, in orthodoxy. They don't do personification figures, but they do a wall of saints. This is the Frangelico version of of the same corporeal likeness that is so for transmundane in order to show unlikeness. Last week I mentioned how the Council of Trent, um, when they start to review what was happening after the press of the, the Reformation and what was happening in a lot of churches where work was getting destroyed, they made the recommendation that perhaps we've been too rational with proportions and perspective and color. And, and so we have this thing that in art history, as they do their Darwinian, this begat that, we have uh, this period called mannerism. And um, unfortunately it didn't happen for art historians. It didn't happen that way. It just didn't happen that way. You can see Michelangelo changing proportions. Vasari in his Lives of the Artists writes that Fiorentino Rosso, who I just showed, uh, and Michelangelo and Pontormo and um, uh, I'm trying to think of El, El Greco. He doesn't mention El Greco, but El Greco is one of them that listens to Trent, they have to said that they changed the proportions that sometimes their figures have nine, 10 heads to them. And um, 
again, this was to show another type, uh, not a style. Uh, mannerism was not a style. It wasn't a bunch of uh, high Renaissance artists saying, you know, I'm really getting tired of this high Renaissance thing. I, I think I'm going to uh, be a mannerist now. What happened was reading the, this is a uh, Parmigiano. Uh, this is our, our uh, Pilar. This is our lady of the Colonna. This is, this is Pilar. And again, you can see how elongated the figure is not to bring any attention to trying to make it too worldly or earthly. So this was the, the attempt of the, the arts of religious art to not do that again um, and make it unworldly, transmundane. So what Visay writes is the arts of this time, mentions by name, had un certo maniera. And of course, art historians get that one word and say, that's it, they were mannerists. And we've got, we've been stuck with that word for 500 years, but it really is a form of Reformation art. Again, you can see the uh, incongru spatial incongruity in, in, in these works where there's a tumbling. It doesn't make sense how it goes from uh, foreground to background, all intentional. Especially in someone like El Greco, this makes no sense spatially whatsoever. But it's, it's, it's for what it does, that's not a criticism in terms of, of good or bad. That's simply, it's not supposed to make sense. It's supposed to be another form of space. It's again, where time and eternity overlap. Tintoretto does it by speeding up. It's sort of like you, you, could, you could have a dial on perspective and turn it fast or slow. And, uh, or not at all. Salvador Dali, of course, does his versions of perspective, two different eye levels, two different uh, vanishing points. This is another Ernest Fuchs, Christ the King. Um, again, like uh, we, we see in the Ghent altarpiece, completely different scales of figures included in the same space. This is not uh, what we call artificial perspective. The message is neither depleting, more depleted, but ongoing and endless. This is really not as much the Last Supper as it really is the transubstantiation. Uh, and Again, the use of, of transparency, translucency in, the, in uh, the Christ figure. This is in the National Gallery in DC. Very difficult to find, by the way. They're always hiding it. It doesn't fit in with anything. It doesn't fit in with the modernist collection. Every time you, you go, you have to ask where it is. And of course, another idea of endless is if the West did one thing, uh, it invented the idea of the idea of infinity, as much as they could depict it. Jesuit uh, priest Andrea Pozzo, Andrea del Pozzo starts these these um, unbelievable ceiling, writes a treatise on on perspective that gets translated into seventeen different languages. Is that the Church of the Jesu there, the yes. Jesuit Mother Church? Yes, that's the Jesu. Sorry, I forgot. Here's the uh, four continents. It's interesting when, when you think that be prior to this, uh, prior to the Counter-Reformation um, that Michelangelo got uh, uh, criticized for the four winds uh, as, as having, uh, the, excuse me, the four uh, directions of the, of the earth at the last judgment, uh, having too much wind in them, that there was no weather. So, uh, It's another uh, Andrea Del Pozzo. And again, uh, another contemporary artist, um, I showed you him, his uh, St. Martin de Pours, uh, Raul Berzosa, um, doing phenomenal work in, in Spain. This is his ceiling, the coronation of the Virgin. So we do, we do see a lot going on. Then we have what I call 
the new iconoclasts. And I'm not so concerned, believe it or not, about all the statue toppling and the threats. This will happen. I don't think we'll ever be quite free of that uh, as long as they're accessible right now. It's just the times we live in. But the, the iconoclasts I'm more concerned about is the internal ones, not the external ones. And how do we how do we get around this now that they're here? So it, it's us, it, it's really us, it's on us to do this. We can't ask people to uh, stop attacking statues. We could, but it, it's not gonna be as much for our uh, betterment if we take care of ourselves within. This of course is uh, Carlo Acutis again. And it's as if um, he can't get out of this, this, this color range. He can't get out of um, the backpack, the laptop. That's it, they are his attributes. Here's a, a statue of St. John Amola taken directly from the photograph as if she is not, has not entered paradise at all. She's not before the beatific vision. We're seeing how photographs, how paintings can influence photographs, which is a very good thing. So other artists are thinking. It has even in, influenced cinema. So art has had a great effect on the photograph, is, but the photograph is maybe, how do we get the photograph to have a good influence on us? This is a Pasolini took, taken right from uh, the uh, Pontormo. I think there is a, a, a way to do this and it's by the elements of revelation, illumination and transfiguration. Transfiguration, the moment of transfiguration is a pivotal point in, in uh, scripture and of course in theology. Uh, again, we have this, what they call Tabor light, which is invisible and blinding. As we see it in the Raffaello, the Raffaello uh, does a combination of things where he's got two separate scenes, completely two separate scenes, upper and lower, that um, again, in, in terms of art history, uh, don't get spoken of as much or talked about as much, uh, tries to portray this dazzling, blinding light to the three disciples. And of course, we understand that they say, oh, can we build booths here? Can we, can we build tabernacles here? And of course, the answer is no, because this doesn't, it's not supposed to be fixed. It's not that kind of, of, uh, of uh, revelation. And um, we have the, the demonic boy on the bottom. What's amazing about what Raphael does here is if we look at the uh, demonic child, he's got one arm up and one arm down. But what's interesting is he has one eye. If we cover, if, if you ever get in front of this and you cover the one eye that's looking backwards, he is looking up to the transfiguration. So it's, it's very sort of emblematic of our two worlds as well, the, um, the temporal and the eternal, the visible and the invisible. Revelation. This is, uh, um, again, Blake's version of the angel of Revelation. Revelation can come in different light forms as we see in uh, various depictions of, of the adoration of the Magi where uh, the comet, the star, whatever. So it could be external light. The light of the transfiguration is a blinding light. It's um, uh, what some would say is, is a contaminating light, just like the, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you can't touch it. It will contaminate you. You're, you it, it's uh, too much. Of course, we can use it for contemplation and uh, um, Delatour paintings uh, that I showed before for uh, does it very, very well. So light becomes a contemplative force, even when the outside. But our, our saints have had some revelation. We know that they've, they've had some revelation and some illumination. Otherwise, they wouldn't be, as we declared, sanctified right now. This is Theophane Bernard. Sorry, I'm going too fast. That was um, St. Bernadette, of course. 
St. Bernadette, St. Therese, St. Theophane Bernard. Padre Pio, always now is always depicted as, as a, an old man when he received his stigmata at a very young age, but we choose to portray him by his photographs. Maximilian Colbe, all experience some sort of, in my mind, some sort of light, internal or external. So here we have, uh, uh, again, the uh, blinding light, St. Paul's conversion. And of course, um, noses in the burning bush, a blinding light. This is the same light as, as, as Tabor. Both Fatima children and St. Bernadette have apparitions. Again, the artist here depicts the apparition of Lourdes as, as, as light. And of course, the miracle of Fatima was with light. Here's Padre Pio. That's how old he is at a photograph with his stigmata. And again, not depicted this way. St. Francis Cabrini and St. Francis Xavier. What I'm finding out as I do more and more research on this is that we're not bringing these saints together and they are together. So uh, I've never seen a painting of St. Francis Xavier and St. Francis Cabrini who had the same mission in life. Pier Giorgio, he goes from one extreme to the other, photograph, a pseudo icon, and of course, the guy with the pipe and the little hair thing coming down, that seems to be it. I have much more respect and tolerance for this kind of imagery than those other ones. This is Coptic. This, again, this is not a style, this is a tradition, and but yet we know these people are uh, holy. Transfiguration. Again, you know, we have our, our incorruptibles and what do we do with this? So we know what they look like in life. Now we know what they look like as an incorruptible. How do we make the change and make devotional art or sacred art or whatever we call it um, and use their images? Here's um, Blessed Miguel Pro photograph of his execution. How do we turn this into uh, devotional work? And this is uh, Neil Carlin's drawing from that. And here's the painting uh, at La Crosse, Wisconsin, all put together. Of course, he's wearing a chasuble with the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe on the back um, as he's uh, elevating the Eucharist. So there are ways of using these these photographs to going from the mundane to transmundane, as it were, going from the temporal to the eternal. Um, of course, we have the um, the Coptic martyrs. The photograph is again their their temporal existence. This is a I think incredible invention, wonderful icon. Mars of Libya. And this I think is, is a, a great attempt to um, really put them in this, in this sort of sacred framework where um, they're following Christ with his cross. It is a, a Quo Vadis painting This, I think, is one of the few works I've seen of, of uh, Padre Pio where he's in context with, with uh, Christ carrying the cross. Usually he's, he's uh, um, not doing anything. Again, this is another Gasparo image of uh, how he's readdressing things. And I think we have a great opportunity here. Either going backward or forward, it, it doesn't matter. But to take some of the uh, concepts from uh, sacred art in the past. This is a wonderful invention or reinvention or representation of 
Christ as the wine press, the sacred wine press, where he, uh, uh, these, are, these are current paintings that he's doing. So um, I really salute him, transfiguration. Now, here's a, a, a young woman who has what she calls the Saints Project. She's here in Philadelphia and she finds people who she feels resembles, her first name is Carol, I'm sorry, her last name slips in right now, uh, resembles saints in their life. So uh, we've all seen sort of kind of paintings of Maximilian Kolbe with, with the uh, uh, prison garb over one shoulder. But I think there's something, there's something uh, very solid about um, this, this type of photography. She does manipulate it a great deal so that it does look more like a tenebrous painting. Edith Stein, I'm not really uh, finding much about her, although in terms of, of sacred art, she again is someone who needs to be redressed in this way. St. John Amola, last week I, I talked about um, the use of flesh and here's uh, St. Perpetua. St. John Amola, as we know, you know, died in childbirth and sacrificed her, her her life so that her child would live. Why she's not being portrayed with other saints because we, we've got to erase the, the time frame between our saints if we want to show them in glory. That makes it also, we break that wall between time and eternity. Uh, Saint John Amola with Saint Elizabeth and uh, Blessed Mother. Why not have three women, expectant women together I did propose this and I did the drawings for it for a church of St. John Amola and they, St. John Amola pregnant with the, uh, the visitation behind it and uh, it was rejected. Uh, the complaint was um, that it was too pro-life, if you can imagine. But anyway, uh, here's Pierre uh, uh, um, Giorgio again, third order Dominican. Can he please be represented with St. Dominic and St. Catherine of Siena, who, who he read fervently. Here we have uh, Carlo Cudis again, and a holy card of St. Tarsisius. And here we have St. Dominic Salvio and Carlo Cudis. Why not have all of them, St. Tarsisius, and Carlo Cudis and uh, Don Salvio together, perhaps even St. Tarsisius greeting them. These are three saints of the, of the Blessed Sacrament. Therese, St. Therese and St. Theophane Venard never met in life. Um, Therese only read about him. He had uh, been beheaded in Hanoi. And of course her being, um, patroness of the foreign missionaries, she would read his letters. She actually had uh, this photograph, a daguer daguerreotype pinned to her infirmary curtain, and she would point to it while she was sick and say, Theophe knows, he knows. So um, I did this composition uh, for Cardinal Burke some time ago of St. Theophane introducing St. Therese to the Vietnamese converts. And there's, of course, the Christ child and the Holy Face. So it's, people could identify it a little more as St. Therese of the child Jesus of the Holy Face and Theophane uh, with the Bay of Halong in the background and, and the Vietnamese converts. So I think there's great potential for all these images. We, we, we have the, all the information we need and we have some incredibly talented artists out there. But again, the, the thing that ties all this together is, is uh, the sacraments. And the one in particular is the reception of the blessed sacraments. There was, there's, there's all, the, all these saints we know were uh, participated in the sacraments and we're not depicting them as such. Uh, here's about a Botticelli of St. Bernard. Here's St. Francis' last uh, Eucharist, his viaticum. Pope Benedict with uh, St. John Paul II. This is uh, a work that needs to be done. One thing that uh, has been resurrected as well is 
a, the painting of St. John giving the Blessed Mother the, the Blessed Sacrament. So these, are, these works are waiting to be done. Mother Teresa in community uh, giving the Blessed Sacrament to her sisters. And it is in that sense of community. This is um, by a, a very talented woman for the, she did for the uh, 800th anniversary of the Dominicans at St. Joseph's. And every one of them, I'm not sure if that figure is not um, Pier Giorgio or, or not there behind Fra Angelico with the palette. It, it is, I, I, it have is. The, uh, I have the, list of saints when the I purchased schedule. it is Pier Giorgio yeah wonderful that's good to know thank you Bernadette Car Karsten Karstensen very very incredible beautiful work Father Tim has you seen this in person yeah so for our 800th anniversary the original was displayed in Columbus Ohio at a gathering yeah. And then they sell very nice copies. I have one in my room, copy of this, yeah. How big is the original? Um, the original is, I don't know, um, four by six, something like that, feet. Wow, that's pretty big. That's, that's I would think yeah. bigger. It looks monumental. Me but too. Anyway, this work was commissioned in our 800th anniversary of the founding of the order. So 2016 after 1216. Okay. And, um, it was also the year I made my solemn vows to be a Dominican until death. So it was kind of a, a painting very much connected with that moment in my life. Yeah. Wonderful. For the rest of my life. For the rest of your life. That's it for tonight. And, and we're going to be here, of course, for some questions and any answers that you have as well. Next week is going to be our fourth and final. And these last three weeks will lead up to this in terms of images uh, and how we use them or don't use them. And uh, one of the things that uh, I've seen and we've all seen in a sense that even though we've used all these incredible figures throughout history in modernism, uh, one figure has been missing for quite a while. And that is this guy. The great I am not, as they say, one of the devil's greatest tricks is to try to convince you that he, she, it doesn't exist. Um, so we're going to be covering that next week, when, how, why it's used as we go toward uh, Holy Saturday Vigil and do you renounce Satan and all of his and or her and its empty promises. So again, thank you for your participation and uh, We'll be here for some questions. Thank you, Anthony. We'll give you a round of applause. Not simply courtesy, but genuine. We mean it. Um, thank you, thank you. So thank anybody you. that would like to chip in, um, I have a question or two, but I don't want to always steal the lead. Anyone else, uh, something come up? Well, I'd just like to say that the uh, the Moki statues are back on the altar in they Orlando. Are? Yes, they are, wow. and they're they're beautiful. It's a it's a beautiful arrangement that they've done, one on either side, and it just it's very dramatic. Yeah, that's that's the thing. For George, I tried two or three times, but I haven't been to Orvieto for a while. So thanks for letting me know that if I ever get back. Oh uh, yeah, it's it was it was nice. Yeah, yeah. There's there. Those are statues, Mogi statues of so the angel Gabriel, and I didn't show the one of uh, of. Uh, our Lady Virgin. of the Annunciation, and she's got the chair tipped. It's it's sort of that hmm. uh, again. He does the same thing where it's a stop action. Uh, it, it's it's still happening. It's still occurring, and it does have a tendency to give a great sense of witness. Of course, it didn't go along with the Fra Angelicos and the Signorelli, but nevertheless, uh, you know, beauty matches beauty. So we can't again. I, I we can't really play that zeitgeist game of. Of, of matching or their Darwinian game of, of uh, this begat that, you know, it's yeah. all of beauty, so it does match. Anthony, here's a question briefly from the chat. Why are some of the saints in the last slide of the Dominican saints, 
Why are some in the forefront smaller? You, you have a... No, I don't. I, I noticed one very much smaller and I think, uh, and, and I, but I couldn't identify it a few. Well, I, think, I think it could be Blessed Imelda Lambertini who died when she was, I think, even less than 10 years old. So okay. it could have been her age. Yeah. All right. That will make sense. Anyone else too, please feel free to ask a question or make a comment. Yes. Well, if you won't, I'll let you formulate. I will. Two quick things. Sure. A lot of this was, instead of looking at the flesh, how do we depict the human flesh, difference between nakedness and nudity last week? This week seemed to be depicting especially saints in that you're saying those who have had, they finally accomplished and they, by God's grace, received the great prize of having the likeness of God restored to them. Now, that happens throughout our lifetime. So it involves their lifetime, but it especially happens in their interest in the glory. I guess um, I just wanted to comment and say that is theologically on track to say when if we've lost, if we're in the image of God, we've lost the likeness of God. It's true that that's really not complete until we reach God's kingdom. And yet that's the difficulty is that we're depicting saints who all the details and symbols and facts we know about their life. We're happening here on earth. We're trying to depict them in the place of reward where they're actually restored. So there's, there's always sort of this room I see for, for art to add and to kind of shape the image of the saint because, and, and not just say, well, here's what happened in the earthly life um, because, because we're trying to depict their restored likeness to God. Um, the second thing I would I would kind of ask though of you, Anthony, is that what what are your quick thoughts on um, when we're looking at uh, you you had that section at the end where in saints and in, in sacred conversation with each other and and there um, you've worked on commissions you've had a lot of ideas both accepted and also rejected. Mm -hmm. um, do you, some people have specific ideas of a specific thing in their mind and then artists want to do all of these complex symbols and, and things. What can you speak to about sort of that tension between the artist and their versus kind of the things the people paying want? Well, the people, and I'm not asking you to vent in no, public. No, no, no. If you want to, you no. can, but. Well, uh, usually, um, well, again, it depends on whether uh, you are to depict someone who um, we have photographs of, right? Like Saint Therese, like Saint Theophane Bernard, or someone like Saint Dominic or Saint Francis or Saint Catherine of Siena. That becomes a little more uh, open, but nevertheless, um, I find artists who, for me personally, artists that depict them in the most mundane ways. And again, one of the conventions in Western sacred art is to idealize them. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, not to just do a, 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 a version of them. I mean, there's, there's, this, there's a big bronze in, in Kasha of St. Rita and nobody knows it's St. Rita. She really does look a crazy housewife, <laughs> okay? This is, you know, she's just, out there with their hands up screaming at the air or something with a kerchief on. Nobody knows who it is. It's, oh no, that's a modern. No, it's not a modern. It, yes, it's a modern something, but it's not St. Peter of Kasha. <laughs> so yes, she doesn't have to always appear in her Augustinian habit. She was married. She did have two children. Um, and she doesn't have to be done in some sort of uh, high Renaissance style either. But I think there's there's a, a way of doing this where, um, and again, for, to answer, I'm usually not dealing with the 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 client. Usually is um, priest or bishop or or an order. I've done things for for the sisters of of uh, Holy Family of Nazareth as well, and um, but it's not necessarily about actual likeness uh, in terms of what they look like in, on Earth. And when I did the 11 Martyrs of Novogrodek, I chose to show them from the back, not show their portraits at all. And we did a, an anamorphic uh, relief of 
their bodies forming um, suffering, the face of suffering Christ. And the sisters loved it. So it's, one, it's in their chapel. It's in the, so there, I think there's so many different ways of, of doing this. But um, when it gets too specific and the hands get tied, then none of us can do anything. I think you've got to let uh, the artist try to be as inventive as possible. Not experiment, but invent. Anthony, a, a few quick questions, too. We'll just kind of go in bullet points. You don't have to elaborate fully, but just kind of first thoughts from the chat. So three quick things. Um, you had said that Rodin would not be put in a church or venerated. Quick thoughts on that. Well, I don't think he wanted to. He, he didn't. He just, he just used St. John as a theme. And of course, it, there's no attributes. How would I recognize? It's a nude man walking. George, what do they call Do they call that? They don't call it St. John anymore, do they? That statue of Rodin? I think they still do. Uh, really? Usually it's just referred to as man walking, but yeah. it is St. John walking, and you see that in the art book. So You're okay. saying it was never Rodin's intention to be in that space? I don't think it was ever intended for a church either. Another quick comment, too, is that uh, Anthony Rago said this is beautiful, and it reminded him the presentation because of so many saints of Dante's Paradiso. I think that's a good comment there. <laughs> Um, people are saying yeah, other comments. Thank you. It's always interesting. Do you know if there's been an exhibit? Susan asks of if there have been photographic exhibits of the saints. I, I wonder. I've mostly just done internet searches. I don't know of of a of, a, of an exhibit. Um, Marge Zilla also says this is an interesting comment, and I thought this too. It seems like tranquility or even joy and suffering often. In, in art shows transcendence, shows something heavenly. There's a lot of serenity of the saints. Maybe comment on that. Absolutely. And again, it's um, where I, I don't think, uh, I mean, I, I, have a, I would have a hard time contemplating on that altar of St. John Amola with her child because I also have met her daughter. She's an adult now. So again, it's the timestamp. It's very hard for me personally to contemplate on um, that kind of, if it's intended to be you know, some sort of religious art. I don't mind looking at a photograph at all. That's not it. Uh, and and uh, there's a lot of fond memories there. Um, what do you think it is particularly about the serenity? Is that something that just also, as she says here in transcendence or heavenly quality, like there was one modern painting you showed of Christ, the, the new wine press. Yes. And there's all these people holding cups, but Christ's facial expression almost looked like a sort of smile. And I thought when I first saw that, why isn't he more serene if he's Christ, Christ crucified? You know, there's something about uh, the facial expression didn't match for me. And because I think I expect serenity. Yeah. I, I would say, I don't know the artist person, but it could be he was trying to show acceptance. That's another. Uh, theme that we see in, in a lot of art that deals with the passion. Um, right. So. There's also a comment, a good one from Caroline saying that in the Ghent altarpiece, Adoration of the Mystic Lamb, that there was a, they combined local martyrs with also the early martyrs and apostles, kind of those, like, like what you were saying, that, that placing them together. They did that, she's saying, yeah. Yes, Caroline knows, she studies that again, altarpiece. And she smiled, yes. there you go. Um, anybody else too, that was what was in the chat. Any any few more questions or comments, uh, you wanna unmute yourself, tune in. Um, uh, Tony, you, you made one statement that I found very interesting. You said that mannerism uh, is really a form of reform, um, Counter-Reformation art. Uh, in other words, prior to the Baroque, which we usually think of as counter-reformation, you know, that's counter-reformation. But um, how is? Uh, I've always heard a mannerist period. Reformation, not counter-reformation, just reformation. I thought, of, I thought of that too, George. Tell us a little more about Trent. So you're saying people like Michelangelo, who's alive during Trent, they changed their art some because of Trent's suggestions to make it more heavenly, less earthy. Yes, that was the recommendation that they should, one of the recommendations was to look at the Gothic. And of course, looking at the Gothic, the figures do have a tendency to be more elongated and the Gothic didn't use the artificial perspective of 
uh, Alberti, um, nor did they have, regardless of whether they had anatomy or didn't have anatomy, they didn't use it. it again, they, they were, uh, if you want to say it, they were, they were trying to make an, a non-earthly uh, figure. So did the Renaissance, uh, uh, I don't want to say the Renaissance went too far and that the school of Athens should have never, I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's the pinnacle for us. Athens, absolutely, no doubt about it. Form, space, light, time in such a logistic constancy that it, it's just remarkable work. But does that lend itself to what happened after Luther is the question when the work is being attacked. You have to, you have to realize that it's the first time in 1500 years the church had to defend its art and uh, not have it any, any more just-, just uh, That came up last time too. Wasn't, wasn't uh, Trent involved in somewhat covering over the nude figures in the Last Judgment, the Sistine Chapel? Yes, absolutely, and absolutely. To not have the body fully shown. Yeah. So, so as to avoid Protestant attacks. To avoid Protestant attack. Exactly. But um, no, George, if I said counter-reformation, I meant to say reformation. And I know you, you've also read up a great deal on Michelangelo reinventing the figure uh, during that time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's true. No, yeah. it's interesting, though. Often I've heard of mannerism as being despondent or a period of crisis and so on. And that was an interesting, you know, reversal of that idea. Well, it was this period of crisis, but not for for art galleries or museums. I mean, they, uh, it's hard to get art historians out of that milieu, as it were. They, artists, these were not uh, gallerists. They were, they were uh, um, employed by the church and commissioned by the church to do these things. There's no, I don't know if there's any uh, genre piece. I mean, he does the Podra Cayano, but that's still, you know, uh, uh, still done the same manner. So um, I don't know of any genre art that Michelangelo does, or nothing of Florentino Rosso, and certainly nothing of, uh, I mean, El Greco's either doing uh, altarpieces or he's doing painting portraits of cardinals and bishops that's it uh-huh uh-huh well anyway that that was in, very interesting thank you sure sure thank you thank you we have here also a quick comment that robin davis says uh giovanni gasparo's surrealism or realism would you say this is meant for a church it's been described as strange, profane, obscuring he, meaning, but he gets his work in a lot of churches. Absolutely, absolutely, his stuff. A lot of his things are already installed in altar pieces in a lot of these uh, Sicilian Baroque churches, and they look incredible. They they fit automatically in that environment. Hmm. You see these big frames with with clouds and gold rays coming out of them, and it's, boy, that that worked. Work. Well, anybody else before we, uh, we have Holy Week coming up. Everybody knows that, right? We're coming up on Holy Week. We're aware of this. Okay. <laughs> um, and I think this will be a great presentation on the demonic because this is also the week that before Christ is raised from the dead, he is betrayed and, you know, the, the, the evil one has his hour. Um, so I'm, I'm very intrigued by the final talk of the series. Um, Another thing, too, which I'll mention is that we're compiling all of Anthony's previous classes on Zoom, not only this time, but of, of last year and the year before, in a single kind of YouTube playlist, like a like an online classes portfolio. And we'll be once the series is done, we'll also be sharing that because um, yeah, it's just good to have record of, you know. Thank you. Thank you, Father. I appreciate it. So the next week is it's going to touch on everything that I've spoken on. Uh, thus far in terms of of proportion form color light and why it really changes dramatically when we are portraying the demonic but the other question also i think underlying is uh how do we um what happened to it why is is this ongoing battle between good and evil no longer to be portrayed in sacred art it's not that it ended so 
have, have we not been using it to our advantage? And it, it, as always with the Visco series, it's a cliffhanger. So I guess we'll have to tune in. Tune in next uh, week, same time, same station. Like it's, it's like a Netflix series. I don't watch Netflix anyways. It's, it's great to uh, have you all with us. It's great to... Um, yes, thank you all again. Christian, it's great to be all these things. So it's great to have this history and review it. So we'll see you all next week, hopefully. Yes. We do renounce Satan and all his or her empty promises, which the people at St. Patrick's and all around the world will be asked. Yes. They're baptized. And until next time. All right. Thanks as always, Maestro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I'll see Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. So nice to Wonderful see you again. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. You're looking Anthony. good. Thank you so much. Good night, Paul. Thank you. Good night.